Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. On March 27, 2024, Premier Doug Ford and the governing Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario tabled Ontario's 2024-2025 provincial budget. Now, according to the province, quote, the 2024 budget demonstrates how the government is continuing to deliver on its plan to build by investing in infrastructure to get more homes built faster, attracting better jobs with bigger paychecks, keeping costs down for families and businesses, and retaining a path to balance, end quote. Minister of Finance Peter Bethenfalvy, who tabled the 2024 provincial budget, said, quote, in the face of global economic uncertainty and high interest rates that continue to put pressure on Ontario's families, our government is taking a responsible approach by investing to rebuild Ontario's economy without raising taxes, end quote. Now, we caught up with Colin Best, the president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, for his reaction to the provincial budget. President Best's perspectives promises to shed light on the implications of the provincial budget and how it impacts municipalities across Ontario. This is Municipal Affairs. Well, we have a big following in southwestern Ontario, so hopefully yeah. we get the message out a little bit. Um President Best, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting your initial reactions as president of the Association of Municipalities of Ontario to this week's provincial budget. From a municipal standpoint, was there anything in there for municipalities? Yes, there is some improvements, uh, not only in the uh, uh, funding, which uh, the ministers have mentioned about the $1.8 billion in terms of infrastructure grants, which it's good, but it's a first step because we still have a huge deficit, it's about a billion dollars a year due to Bill 23. So we're having discussions. I've met with three cabinet ministers over the last two days. So they understand our concerns and what we're asking for is a social and prosperity review so that municipalities are revenues you know, are tied with the economy, not property taxes, because we basically have a system that goes back to the Victorian area, uh, property taxes, user fees, and in some cases, development charges. Well, unfortunately, those got cut, and we've been pushing the minister, could you make us whole? We were promised, uh, what was it, 481 days ago that we'd be made whole, and we're still waiting. Uh, it's also uh, areas such as reducing the assessment on uh, multi-residential homes so it's basically this equivalent to residential which is going to encourage more apartment constructions and also increases in mental health and some highway infrastructure projects such as highways 11 and 17 in northern ontario which are vital to the economy of northern ontario i have spoken to many of your member communities over the last few weeks over the last few months even in the last year and one thing that i hear from mayors and councillors even wardens across uh, ontario is the need for infrastructure dollars to help build those houses um yep. fcm just recently came out with a, a survey that said it costs about one hundred seven thousand dollars per every unit of household for municipalities to put infrastructure into those and that's average and i say average i want to make sure i say average um does this budget go far enough? Because I know they did uh, introduce more uh, funding for the Building Faster program, but does do municipalities have a partner in building these housings in their own backyards right now with this budget? And actually, if you uh, follow Mike Moffat, he just uh, shows his latest graph how it basically fell off a cliff in terms of house constructions. And I talk to builders all the time, and they basically said the cost of materials, labor, and finance, if you can even get financing, because some of their longtime lenders aren't even lending because – you know, they, they figure that, you know, something's there's going to be a correction there. And I'm seeing this in the real estate market as well. I was a property appraiser for 30 years that uh, you were now finding people are selling properties that, you know, they basically didn't make any money over the last three or four years. So we've got to be very careful in how we deal this. And I, I certainly appreciate that the minister's, uh, you know, discussing with us, but we really need to sit down all three levels because we have a misunderstanding between the federal and provincial governments, which we're hoping to uh, resolve because Ontario is the only province where housing was downloaded to the municipalities 30 years ago. And right now the pro federal government's looking at withholding $355 million in housing. Well, that's not the provincial responsibility. It's municipalities. And our service managers are saying, yeah, we're doing as much as we can, but our costs went up 51% in two years. I talked to my social services uh, commissioner from Halton, 
And basically to build a one bedroom apartment, you know, just basic bare bones, you're looking $800,000 in the Oakville, Burlington, Milton and Halton Hills area. I understand in Hamilton's over 600,000. They just completed a new building there. So the, the costs went through the roof. We've got, you know, at least a four year waiting list for such things as assisted housing and long term care, which is another growing issue, which people have got to realize that uh, when us uh, baby boomers uh, hit uh, 80 to 85, we're going to be in real problems because we just don't have enough uh, assisted housing there as well as the, the labor costs as well, because a lot of times we're finding in a lot of sectors, there just isn't a lawyer. I just had a hydro meeting this morning. Good luck trying to find a lineman these days or a line person, I should say. So when I when I speak to mayors and councillors, I often hear this statement when they get approached by residents from their community, they often say, you come to me with a problem, you come with a solution as well, because let's work together. What yeah. is the solution to address this housing backlog and the housing shortage that Ontario is going through right now? Because like you, you said, the, you're off the cliff now. The housing start numbers are not where I'm assuming Premier Ford or even the municipalities want. What is the solution to help address some of these backlogs and get more housing built by that timeline that Premier Ford has set to a lot of municipalities? No, the, the first thing is basically getting all three partners at the table because I've been, been in numerous meetings with cabinet ministers. Oh, could you talk to the other the province of the federal government for us? It's like, don't haven't you ever heard of a phone? You can talk to each other because there seems to be a misunderstanding of who's responsible for what, even within government. So we need them to work together. We need to match infrastructure. You know, you know, of all sorts with population growth. And we don't have a population plan in this town region. And you can see, just see with, with the growth numbers, we were looking at a million people. Well, we've never had a million people come into Canada, even at the peak you know, of Laurier or the, in the 1900s. You know, we basically didn't have the kind of a need for an infrastructure. Now we have all sorts of it. And you know, such things anywhere from rural internet to water, sewers, and having the, the people in place, because when people immigrate you know, to this area, they're also bringing relatives with them as well that need care and need health care. And we have, give you an idea, our hospital in Milton was expanded six years ago. It is now full and there's no plans to expand it. And that's the issue we have in a number of other growing municipalities. And the other issue in the rural and remote areas is they have no growth. They have declined, but they've increased costs. So we need to find a way to equitably you know, finance these areas. And whether it's tied in with income taxes or sales taxes or some way that it grows with the economy. You look at in European countries and even the United States, you know, their transit systems are covered by the state or national governments. You talk about rural and remote health, and I just recently sat down with two rural Ontario mayors over the last few weeks, and healthcare came up, mental health and addiction came up. Now, you and I both know that this is not in the municipal jurisdiction, but more and more municipalities are dealing with this. This budget does address some of the challenges that rural communities are facing. They do increase it. While it's probably a good first step, could they have gone further? I'm not sure because uh, uh, Minister Bethethal called me before that the budget was announced and highlighted some of the issues. And I appreciate, you know, his candor. And But, you know, every, every government is facing challenge. You have unlimited demands and a limited budget. And you have directions from your, your you know, either your premier, your prime minister or, or your public, as in our case. And we just have to work out what's, you know, we can't solve it overnight, but let's work on a path to doing it because it's, it's a real challenge. Because give you an idea in terms of infrastructure, according to FCM and AMO staff, uh, municipalities across Canada are looking at $250 billion in infrastructure costs over the next 10 years. A hundred billion of that is uh, uh, growth related. And then when the province offers us a billion, it's like, oh, thank you very much, but uh, we need more help. We need that extra $99 billion to come along with yeah. us. Um, yeah. there it's was... also amazing because oh. on that, that point, because the private sector can only do uh, so much as well, and they've got their challenges, and the Home Builders Association have highlighted that. But we need a, a, a basically a meeting in the minds. Okay, you do this and you do that type of thing and compromise. And, and uh, we've indicated as a board that we're willing to, to compromise on some issues, but we need to see a clear path so we have predictable and sustainable funding. One of the big uh, sort of 
eyebrow raises that I had during the budget was the new introduction of the Community Sports and Recreational Infrastructure Fund that is brand new. And it is, I just want to make sure I'm getting the right number here, 200 million fund to strengthen communities across Ontario by investing in new and upgrading sports fields. Um, mm-hmm. Was this a request? Because uh, it's not something that I've uh, even had conversations with with municipal leaders, but it seems like the provincial government wants to help municipalities improve their sports fields. Yeah, well, it's certainly appreciate. We must remember there's 443 uh, municipalities that are part of AMO, Toronto. We're, we're on good terms. We're working together with, if you divide it up, it's less than a million dollars per uh, uh, community. And that doesn't even fix one or a hockey arena. And a lot of them are 50, 60. We've got one in Milton that's like 50 years old. And we're saying, okay, do we keep upgrading it or do we you know, build a new one? And that's where a lot of smaller communities that don't have the growth, don't have development charges are looking to it because, you know, the arenas and the sports fields are a major community hub for them. That's basically where the whole community gathers. So we have to work out what's equitable. And I appreciate the, the uh, provincial government doing it. But we need to have a, a larger picture because these one-time funds are great. Our school board's in the same situation. It took seven years in my municipality to get a new high school approved. It shouldn't take that long. Speaking of your municipality, was there anything in this municipality in this budget for Milton that you sort of took away and said, you know what, Milton's a little bit better because we asked for it and they gave it to us? There, well, there were some indications about improving the uh, go line, but unfortunately, we have some uh, legal challenges and uh, infrastructure challenges with CP Rail. But uh, that's uh, a nice, but you know, we basically need to see action because we had a promise to expand our uh, go station oh, five years ago, and we haven't seen any equipment on site. So. It's, you know, like anything, you know, you've got political promises and we have reality and, you know, we we need to do better, you know, of all levels of government because people need to see, okay, actions being done. We just had the 401 wide intersection, but we also need transportation of all forms. Um, my last question, and it's a political one for you here. I've got to ask because I've asked every single one of your sister organizations, whether that be MNL, Alberta Municipalities, SUMA, SARM, AMMM. Next week, I'll be asking Cam Blight. But are municipalities better off today than they were prior to this budget being tabled? Uh, well, could you get back to me in six months? Because <laughs> we, our, our staff are still analyzing. If you go to amo.on.ca, you'll see some of the analysis you know, it's as, as I mentioned to the ministers, you know, Calandra and uh, Bethenthal, that, you know, it's a step in the right direction, but we need to go further. We'll, we'll be, basically, we appreciate, you know, we've had a rough, you know, three years between the, the pandemic and some of the changes provincially, but we need to get closer. We need to basically sit down. We have what's called our MOU table, the Memorandum of Understanding, which we've had for 20 years. We want to strengthen that and renew it and just basically sit down and say, okay, here's what we're prepared to do. Can you help us? And we've been doing that with the housing challenges that the province has given us. They need to help us with infrastructure. What's next now for AMO? Because I'm assuming now that the budget's tables, I'm assuming you just don't walk away. What's next for AMO? I'm assuming advocacy still is going to be going on with yeah. cabinet ministers as well. Yeah. We we have um, hopefully monthly meetings. That's why I said about the MOU table where we sit down with ministers on a one-on-one basis between our senior executive and the, the ministers and their staff. And we've had a very healthy discussion. And some of those measures have been adopted, as you mentioned. But we need to do more and we need the cooperation of all three orders of government because this is a current dispute between the federal and provincial government needs to resolve. You know, $355 million could be used by municipalities right away. I've got a, a project sitting in my own community that if we had everybody working together, we'd have it under construction by now. It's been sitting there for five years. I wish you the best of luck, uh, President Best. Thank you so much for sitting down and chatting today. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. Now, if this episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all the diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, Consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. 
Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.